Chapter 45, Community and Ecosystem Ecology. In this chapter, we're going to cover the ecology of communities, community development, and the dynamics of an ecosystem. So we're going to start off by talking about community structure. As we've mentioned before, populations don't exist in isolation. They're only a small part of the community to which they belong, and a community is going to be a collection of populations of different species interacting with one another within the same environment. So for example, a fallen log can be considered a community because of the many different populations that are living on or interacting in that area. So when we're talking about community structure, there are two characteristics of a community that allow us to compare communities. One is going to be the species composition. The species composition is also called species richness of a community. It's just a listing of the various types of species that are found in that per particular community. Now species diversity, on the other hand, includes both the species richness and the relative abundance of the different types of species. So we're looking at not only how many different species are found there, but how many individuals of each type of species are going to be found in that particular area. So this chapter is going to examine the various types of community interactions and their importance to the structure of the community. Such inter interactions illustrate some of the most important evolutionary selection pressures acting on the individuals, and they also help us develop an understanding of how biodiversity can be preserved. So the community interactions that we're going to be discussing in class are going to be habitat and ecological niche, competition between populations, predator-prey interactions, and symbiotic relationships. So community interactions. Community interactions um, are going to include things like the habitat and ecological niche. And just to help uh, clarify some of our vocab here, uh, the habitat is going to be the area where an organism lives and reproduces. The ecological niche, on the other hand, is going to be the role that species plays in its community. This is going to include the methods that a species uses to meet energy, nutrient, and survival demands. Now, because a species niche is determined by both biotic and abiotic factors, ecologists like to differentiate between a fundamental niche and a realized niche. So a fundamental niche is going to be um, the abiotic conditions under which an organism can survive when adverse biotic conditions are um, absent. So in other words, if there is no competition, if there's no limitation of resources, how, uh, how would that species interact or play a role in that particular environment? The realized niche is not so fun. The realized niche is going to be the set of conditions under which it exists in nature, where adverse biotic conditions are actually present. So the fundamental niche is kind of like, you know, in a perfect world, what would this look like? Realized niche is a little bit of reality. Um, what things are going to look like in our, under our actual conditions. Now, obviously, the fundamental niche is going to be larger than the realized niche. Uh, the fundamental role that, in, that a species could play is a lot greater than um, what is actually realized or what could actually happen. So we're going to talk just a little bit about, um, about competition between two laboratory populations of paramecium. So we're going to talk about comp comp competition between populations. Competition occurs when two, uh, when members of two different species try to use a single resource, things like light, space, nutrients, that's going to be in a limited supply. Now the example of the right is an experiment with two different species of paramecium. Both grew really well on their own. So here is going to be the logistic growth curve of P. aurelia on its own. Here is the uh, growth curve of P. caudatum grown on its own. So both grow very well on their own. But if we put both individuals into the same test tube, only one species really survived. Um, this is this successful species of paramecium has a higher biotic potential than the other. From this and other similar experiments, we came up with the competition competitive exclusion principle. The con competitive exclusion principle says that no two species can indefinitely occupy the same niche at the same time. We found that the two species of paramecium could occupy the same tube if one fed on the food at the bottom while one fed at the food at the top, but they couldn't both be suspended throughout the entire test tube and both effectively um, survive. Um, one is going to outcompete the other for resources. So when we are able to separate the species, you know, have one um, 
one primarily feed at the top of the test tube, one primarily feed at the bottom of the test tube. This is called resource partitioning. It's the apportioning of resources in order to decrease competition between the species. And the resource partitioning leads to niche specialization and less niche overlap between uh, species. So a great example of this would be like owls and hawks. Both feed on small rodents, but one is a nocturnal hunter and one is a diurnal hunter. Um, so what could have been one niche uh, became two more specialized niches because of the divergence and behavior. So because one decided to feed at one night, one decided to feed during the day, um, we see less competition for the same resource among those two different species. Um, another uh, factoid we want to mention is character displacement. Characteristics tend to become more divergent when populations belong to the same community than when they are I, when they are isolated, just meaning that if we are going to be found in the same community, we're going to send, tend to see tend to see um, a greater divergence in their behavior um, if they're going to be competing for the same resources. So, here's another great example of competition between populations. Um, Oh, here we go. Character dis displacement. Characteristics tend to become more divergent when populations belong to the same community than when they're isolated. So a great example of this would be um, the, our five warblers. So in any other forest, the five warblers could probably all feed anywhere they would like on a particular type of spruce caterpillar. However, in a forest where all of these different warblers are present, we're going to find that one breed is going to feed primarily up at the tops of the trees. Another is going to feed a little bit lower down um, on the outside of the tree. Still another is going to be found primarily on the inside of the tree. He's not going to fight for the outermost branches because he can fly in, get into the in between branches and there's an abundance of caterpillars there. The black Oberman warbler can uh, hunt for the, the spruce caterpillar all around the top third of the tree, whereas we're going to see the yellow rumped warbler down here uh, fighting for uh, the resources at the bottom of the tree. So because all of these different warbler species are found in the same area, they're going to develop changes in behavior to find um, uh, hunting patterns that better suit their needs. So another thing we want to mention is the predator, so not just competition among members of the same species, but also predator-prey interactions. Um, so predation. Predation is when one living organism, the predator, feeds on another, the prey. Um, this is going to include everything from predaceous lions, hunting and killing zebras, to herbaceous deer that feed on vegetation. I know we don't tend to think of deer as predators, but they are. They're going to feed on uh, they're going to feed on grasses and leaves and trees, which makes the grasses, leaves, and trees prey, and the deer predators. Now, parasitism is considered a type of predation since they feed off another species, um, and parasitoids are organisms that lay their eggs inside of their hosts. So this is all a form of predation, but we're going to talk about parasitism a little bit more later on. The presence of predators can decrease prey densities and vice versa. For a great example of this would be the prickly pear cactus and moth. A gardener brought prickly pear cactus from South America to Australia, and the cactus wildly spread out of control. I mean, it just went crazy. It had very few competitors. It was able to it was a, it, it was able to grow very very well in Australia, and it just kind of took over. So rather than trying to just slaughter those uh, cactuses wholesale, instead they brought in a moth whose caterpillar only feeds on the prickly pear cacti. Um, so the moth greatly reduced the cacti population and then their population was reduced. And so um, both the species are now found in much smaller numbers because um, the moths came in, they grew, their population expanded out of control because, of course, there was so many prickly pear cactus. But once they ate all the prickly pear cactus, once they greatly reduced that numbers, their own numbers dropped um, in, in harmony, I guess, or in relation to the loss of food source for them. So population density of the predator can be greatly affected by the prevalence of the prey. Um, factors opposing the biotic potential of the cactus came, come into play after the, or came into play after the introduction of the moth, and the carrying capacity of the moth decreased after its food supply was diminished. Um, so predator-prey populations can fluctuate in size. Increase in the predator population is de uh, in population size is dependent on increase in prey population size. 
So instead of a steady rate, a series of peaks and valleys can result from the predator population lagging slightly behind that of the prey. And here on this next page, we're going to look at a graph showing um, the relative populations of the snowshoe hares and the Canadian lynx. So what we see is that the snowshoe hares um, had a period where their population spiked. We saw a huge increase in their population. Um, so the, the snowshoe hare is a common herbivore in the coniferous forests of North America. This is where it's going to feed on twigs of various um, shrubs and small trees. And the Canada lynx it feeds on the snowshoe hares and other small rodents and birds. And studies revealed how the two, pa two populations kind of cycle, cycle frequently. Investigators found that the presence of the lynx was the only factor contributing to the population of the hare, which was causing the cycling, um, or thought that the presence of the lynx was the only factor. Um, but they have since learned that the decline of the snowshoe hare is also accompanied by a low growth and low reproductive rates, which would be indicative of the food shortage. So the hare population cycle spans three trophic levels, the predator prey and the food source for the prey. So what they found is in years when there was really great weather and an overabundance of food for the hare, we see a spike in the population of the hare. However, when there's a spike in the population of hare, not long after that, we see a huge spike in the prey and the predator uh, relationship or the predator, um, the predator size. Well, of course, um, in the predator population, well, a spike in the predator population causes the prey population to drop drastically, whoops, drop drastically. Um, once the predator, uh, once the prey, okay, once the rabbit population drops, the lynx population is not far behind. Well, now that the lynx population has dropped, the rabbit population can start to go up again. As the rabbit population goes up due to uh, better food, more resources, because of course, if there are no rabbits around, there's nothing feeding on the twigs and shrubs, so the twigs and shrubs can have a really good year. Um, so then we start to see the, the hare population go up, and not long behind that hare population, the, uh, the lynx population is gonna skyrocket. Once the lynx population skyrockets, the uh, hare population is going to plummet. And so we sort of see this um, delayed cycling effect, whereas, you know, we see an increase in hares followed by an increase in lynx, followed by a decrease in hares following a decrease in lynx. Prey defenses. Not all of our prey are totally defenseless. They do have the ability to protect themselves from some predators. So prey defenses, these are just mechanisms that thwart the possibility of being eaten by a predator. Prey species have evolved a variety of different mechanisms that help them avoid predators. Things like a heightened sense of speed or, um, or uh, protective armor, protective spines or thorns, tails or appendages that break off, chemical defenses, camouflage. Camouflage is the ability to blend into the background. It helps the prey avoid being detected by the predator. Like this, this is a flounder fish right here. And unless you really knew what you were looking for, you might miss him among the bottom, the rocks at the bottom of the ocean. There's also things like warning coloration. Uh, another common method of avoiding predation is the right colors that serve as a warning, like this poison arrow frog that say, hey, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Um, there are also things like structures that cause the startle response. Um, so for example, this is a lantern fly. He's got a false head. His eye is actually way back here. His head is kind of just right here. And this big bulbous structure off the front is just meant to look like a baby alligator and it helps keep um, predators away if the fly actually looks like a baby alligator. So that's pretty cool. Um, another prey, common prey defense would be things like flocking behaviors, like fish. Um, they'll you know, kind of all stay together in great big large schools. Now, this of course means that the predator is gonna get somebody, but hopefully it's not you if you're hanging out in a really large herd. <laughs> 